may my speech be firmly established in my mind. May the mind too be firmly established in my speech. May there be perfect correspondence between my thoughts, words and actions. May this self-effulgent Lord shine forth in my life. May the truths of the scriptures come to me. May not what I learn from them ever forsake me. Let me live my life day and night according to their teachings. I shall speak what is appropriate. I shall speak the truth. May that protect me. May that protect the teacher. Om. Peace, peace, peace. Spirituality, spiritual practice is not just for in the shrine. It's not just when we're poring over our, our spiritual books. But how do we turn everything we do into spiritual practice? How do we turn that into uh, a life-transforming experience? And... Um, We can, we can uh, understand that in the path of karma yoga, there are, it's, a, it's a very nice way of conceiving it. There are, there, are, there are some misconceptions, first of all. And maybe it's helpful just to remind ourselves of the misconceptions in karma yoga. One, karma yoga does not equal work. It does not simply mean work. Some people work very hard and they say, I'm a karma yogi. But it's how we work that's important. Just doing work does not turn it into karma yoga. It has to be consciously done, uh, and it has a goal. And what is the goal? Self-realization. Self-realization or liberation, freedom. That's the goal of karma yoga. If there's any other goal to our work, then it's karma, it's not yoga. It doesn't have that yoga, unless it's directed towards that or towards the attainment of divine love, that kind of, uh, th that kind of spiritual goal. Uh, so the first misconception is that it, it, that it means work. Actually, it's a spiritual discipline with the goal of liberation, uh, enlightenment, attaining of true devotion. And it needs preparation. It's not that, okay, I'm, anyone can do karma yoga. It actually needs purity of mind. It needs detachment. It needs this fixing of a goal and uh, a, a spiritual orientation to our life. And then uh, there's a nice way of thinking of it as, as, as different stages. And uh, one way of uh, envisioning those stages is that first we do um, work as worship. We do our work as worship. We try to feel that we're doing it as worship. Uh, actually, uh, first, actually, we do work and worship. So I do my worship, and then I do my work, and then I try to feel, that uh, gradually feel. Gradually, it becomes work as worship. We're doing our work, and we're trying to make it as worship. And then the, the last stage is work is worship, when actually the work becomes worship. And there's that separation in our minds and in our lives between our active life and our spiritual life disappears so that everything becomes worship. In that state, we see everything as God, every person as a manifestation of the divine. And so everything we do is an is a act of worship. That's, that's not where we start. We start as work and worship, then work as worship, then finally work becomes, every action becomes an act of worship. And uh, there's three, interestingly, there's an interesting way of conceiving of three uh, renunciations that uh, characterize the different stages of karma yoga. The first is uh, giving up attachment to the results of our action. <clears throat> they put it this way, pala sankalpa tyaga. Pala means fruit, and sankalpa means, uh, how do you put that? It's like the, uh, intention, but it's, it encompasses more than intention. It encompasses desire and our intention and all our, um, uh, that we're placing our energies into this particular activity. So we 
the, the intentions, the desires for the fruits of action, those are to be relinqu relinquished. That's the first stage of relinquishing. The second uh, relinquishment is the karma sankalpa tyaga, giving up attachment to the work itself, uh, where in which we neither seek nor avoid. So we neither seek any particular work nor avoid any particular work. We can see this is already quite an advanced stage. Let's admit, for most of us, <laughs> we're still beginners. Third stage is kartritpa uh, sankalpa tyaga, where we give up the feeling of being the kartri, that the doer, we, the agent. So in that case, who is the doer? God is the doer, or prakriti is the doer. Nature, the gunas do all the work. We just stand by as the witness. So it's a progressive detachment of sankalpa, of intentionality, of that willing uh, to uh, work. First, the fruits, then the work itself, and then finally even the sense of agentship, of doership. So this is uh, a, an advanced state. But we, let's remind ourselves that the goal of karma yoga is not to change the world, not to make the world a better place, but to change ourselves and to attain illumination. And, of course, Swami Vivekananda's ideal of Atmanu Mokshalatam Jagadhitayacha, we do this for our own liberation and for the welfare of the world. It's connected. Yes. All right. So let, the well, let the world be blessed. Let the people be blessed. But that's not the goal. Uh, to, imp to make the world a better place. It, may, it c can be argued convincingly that we can't really make the world a better place because the world is the way it is because it is the world. And it is the land of the karma bhumi, uh, the place where we both uh, sow our karma and reap our karma. So that's why there's, there's uh, this, these pairs of opposites. And we have happiness. And we have misery, we have tremendous pleasure, and we have tremendous suffering also. So it's, um, that's something to remember. So let's look a little bit at this last class for advanced students. And um, the, I'm think, I was thinking about these classes, how, how uh, the, the beginners and advanced, actually the, all the ideas of karma yoga, he keeps coming back to them. And one of the main things he keeps coming back to is this detachment, detachment from the fruits and doing work simply for the sake of doing work, finally doing work and let it be worship. Those ideas keep coming back. And in between, he weaves to all kinds of fascinating ideas and, and uh, also has some uh, humorous digressions, shall we say. Um, So where were we uh, in this um, in this uh, last class? He comes to a point of emphasizing again this vairagya, this detachment, and as the only way to go beyond, you know, go beyond this life, beyond this world, is to give up. And yet he also acknowledges it's not easy; it's very difficult. He acknowledges that, uh, and uh, th there's two ways to to. Uh, embrace this practice of vairagya. One is the negative way, neti neti, not this, not this. This is the most difficult. And uh, iti iti, the um, using, using bondage to break bondage, slowly giving up, seeing the divine in everything, the, the positive way. Um, so, He, re, he, he discusses this idea of duty. And we're, we're just coming up to the point where we left off three and a half months ago, where he's coming on duty. And in an earlier class, the, I think it's the second class for beginners, uh, is titled, What is Duty? And there, as you may recall, those of you who have been all along in this class, uh, Swamiji, first of all, says it's very difficult to define duty because it's it's so different depending on the culture, on your play, your station in life. There's so many. So what may be duty for someone is is a, would be a terrible deed for another. Uh, but 
he suggests that by doing our duty, that work which comes to us naturally, which our swadharma, our natural inclinations, perhaps how, where, in what station we find ourselves in life, uh, that's our duty, and we do it with, uh, as well as we can without hankering for the results of it. And uh, this leads to perfection. This leads to uh, gradually um, reducing our sense of agency, our sense of I am the doer and of, of uh, longing for fruits of action. Uh, so that's the main thrust. And, and he gives the example of the woman from the uh, Vyadha Gita, that uh, monk who gained the psychic powers to uh, burn the crow and uh, then he comes to the, the uh, village begging for alms, and the woman says, I'm not, there's no crow here. You, hold, you hold, hold your horses. And so she had attained spiritual illumination simply by doing her duty of, as a devoted housewife serving her husband. And she sends him for further teachings to the butcher, who had attained spiritual illumination by doing his duty uh, as a, a, a butcher, who would carve up the meat and sell it to the, to the uh, villagers. So... Uh, this idea that simply by doing our duty, that which is before us perfectly, we can attain illumination. But here, this is now a, a later class for advanced students, he comes down hard on this idea of duty because it is, uh, it, it's a sense of compulsion. Mostly what we call duty uh, is some kind of compulsion. We feel compelled to do something and then we say, well, it's my duty. And so he says, uh, uh, let, let me re read just a little bit here. Duty is good. It checks brutality to a certain extent. For the lowest people who cannot have any other ideal, it is something good for them. But for those that want to be karma yogis, they must throw this idea of duty overboard. There is no duty for you and me. Whatever you have to give to the world, give. It is not duty. I love that. Isn't that beautiful? Whatever you have to give to the world, give. Don't call it duty. It's not duty. It, be a giver. Don't ask for anything in return. Just give. If you, you have something to give. Isn't that beautiful? We all have something to give in this world. We all have, as Peace Pilgrim puts it so beautifully, we each have a place in the life pattern. And we, ha we have to find that place. And for some of us, it's... Uh, being a mother and raising children. And, and for others, it's uh, being an uh, artist or a, a, a monk <laughs> or a, a bus driver. We each have a place in the, in the whole pattern and to find that. And then in, the, in that role, what do we do? We give. We have something to give. Give that, what we have. There is no duty. Don't call it duty. Whatever you have to give to the world, give. It is not duty. Do not take any thought of that. Be not compelled. Why should you be compelled? Everything that you do under compulsion is an attachment. You have no duty unto the, under the sun. Give up all duty unto the Lord. His is the duty. What is mine? So there he, uh, he sums up this a higher idea of duty, which is <laughs> we go beyond duty and just what, whatever we have to give, we give. Uh, so then uh, finally, uh, this last section, he starts talking about uh, the different types of great spiritual teachers in the world. And perhaps you recall that he, he describes the greatest teachers as actually unknown, that nobody knew them. They were so pure, so sattvic. He, he uh, employs this idea of the gunas, the satparajas and tamas. I think most of us are familiar with these terms. OK, so good. Uh, the, the, the totally sattvic teachers, the greatest teachers, they're unknown to the world, he says. The Christs and Buddhas, they, had, they came down from that state because uh, to actually teach each, you have to have some rajas. So he says, the greatest men or women in the world have passed and were unknown. Nobody recognized them. The Buddhas and the Christ that you see are but second and third degree men in comparison with them. Uh, so that's, that's interesting. Uh, and he gives an example of Pavari Baba 
who he, next to Ramakrishna, he does, says that he was the most spiritual person he ever knew, next to Ramakrishna. And uh, he says, he is one of the most wonderful creatures I have ever seen. The man in him is gone. If an animal bites him, he is ready to give the other arm to the animal and to say, it is the Lord's will. The Lord has come in the shape of an animal. If a dog or an ass comes, it is the Lord. Everything that comes is the Lord. He will not show himself to men. And yet, he is a magazine of ideas. These ideas will go forth and enter the minds of some other mortals, and they will rise up and teach and establish them. These are the pure sattvikas who can never make any stir but melt down in love. Okay, so that takes us to where we left off last time in September. Um, these, and thinking about it, Sri Ramakrishna, he would put in the same category, but he's, he doesn't talk about his master much. Very seldom he mentions Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, but he would put him in the same category. And if we also understand Sri Ramakrishna couldn't go all over the world preaching preaching Vedanta, teaching the harmony of religions, the divinity of the soul. That was left for Swami Vivekananda, who was also very pure. But that cover was placed over his uh, understanding so that he, he would forget, so that he would have to do mother's work. Because afterwards, he says, the, the, the sattvic, the, these pure people purely established in sattva, they can't work. All right, next, we're going now to the text here. Again, next in order will come men. Uh, Swamiji was speaking in 1896. I edit his speak, speech a little bit while I read to make it, try to make it a little more gender neutral. Next in order will come men and women with more rajas activity who will fight and through whom these ideas will be transferred from these sattvikas. That way, these great men always went. If we read the life of Buddha, we find that he always says, I am the 25th Buddha. There were 24 before. Nobody knows where. They were like these, silently collecting ideas. And these others, Buddha and Christ, had a good deal of rajas or fight in them. And they went from place to place and preached and worked and did all these things. These others are the highest men and women, calm and silent. They are those who really believe and really know the power of thought, so much so that they will go into a cave and close up the door of the cave and simply think five thoughts. And they know that these five thoughts will live through eternity and never die. They will penetrate through the mountain wall and travel into society and will enter into some brain and raise up some person. And that person will give expression to these ideas. These people are too near the Lord to become active and fight, working, struggling, preaching, and teaching God and doing good to humanity. That comes through ignorance. When our nature is evil, then alone can we work. <laughs> OK, so let's stop there for a moment. And reading this, I'm just thinking, I can't help thinking, my god, he's talking about Sri Ramakrishna and himself. It's a, perf it's a perfect reflection. Sri Ramakrishna, could Sri Ramakrishna work? On the one hand, yes. On the one hand, he was extremely active, constantly talking about God. And yet, on the other hand, he couldn't. I mean, he couldn't do what Swamiji did. He couldn't travel to, he couldn't uh, uh, give lectures addressing thousands of people and raise up the consciousness of all those people. He didn't, he was too delicate, too tender, too uh, going into ecstasy all the time. And in fact, he had to drag his mind down forcibly just to talk with the devotees, just to transmit. But that, that he recognized in Vivekananda clearly uh, that this here is the, the man who is going to carry my message to the world. And so it's, it's fascinating how Swamiji is describing this, like he's talking about somebody else. But in some ways, he's really talking about himself uh, as uh, the one who fight. And he had to fight a lot uh, in this country and uh, on a number of fronts. One, missionaries 
who were finding uh, the, the, his, the, their, their funding was drying up because suddenly people are seeing this incredibly spiritual man coming and bringing from India. This is, the, this is the teachings of Vedanta. This is the teachings of the heathens. And how can we call them heathens when this is the result? This, is inc this amazingly spiritual man. So the, their donations started drying up. Uh, so uh, the, the missionary started spreading lies about him. And then from his own people, uh, like Pratap Chandra Mazumdar, who grew terribly jealous. He was also in this country to teach uh, from the Brahma Samaj, and he grew terribly jealous of Swamiji's huge popularity, this young youngster who uh, was just uh, 30 years old when he came here. And uh, he, he, this much senior and better educated, well-respected gentleman of the Brahma Samaj, he, he's nobody next to him. So he also started spreading lies about him. And uh, uh, so he had to fight a lot. So when our nature is evil, well, that, that, that little bit of rajas has to enter to do any work. And yet Swami Vivekananda also called, says about Sri Ramakrishna, uh, Karma kale varma adbhuta cheshtam. What in what incredible and amazing work he did in uh, that's in his hymn to Sri Ramakrishna, the Achandala hymn that goes Naradeva Deva Jai Jai Naradeva. There he describes Sri Ramakrishna as working, but it wasn't work. It was simply people came to him and he would teach. It wasn't like he planned something out. Uh, and in a sense, Swami Vivekananda didn't do that either. He depended entirely on, the, on divine guidance for everything he did, on Mother's guidance. <clears throat> All right, let's go back to the text here. Am I going too fast? Yeah, it's I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> finish this text in half an hour <laughs> because we have a couple more pages. Can you read just a little bit uh, before the part you read before, just the last portion? Last portion means when is that? Uh, up to where you read. Just now? Yeah, yeah, just now. But just back up a little before we yeah, pick it up? Okay, we're backing it up just a little bit. Okay, we're talking, he's talking about the most sattvic who can't work, and the, the, but their, I, their thoughts, uh, the, the, the power of thought, at the same time, someone who's so pure, so fully spiritually illumined, simply the thought that they think will travel out and catch other minds that are receptive, and those minds will pick it up. And uh, so this is the power of thought. So these, uh, the, uh, such people will th simply think five thoughts and die. And they know that these five thoughts will live through eternity and never die. They will penetrate through the mountain wall and travel into society and will enter into some brain and raise up some person. And that person will give expression to these ideas. These people are too near the Lord to become active and fight working, struggling, preaching, and teaching God and doing good to humanity, as Swamiji did. That comes through ignorance. As Sri Ramakrishna said, the veil of ignorance has been placed, but it's very thin. It may be torn at every mo any moment. When our nature is evil, then alone can we work. If you could once see the Lord of the universe and see how he is working, an ever active providence, if you really believe that he is working, he who notes the sparrows fall, would you be able to work the next morning? <laughs> would you not think it a blasphemy while he is taking care of the minutest animal in the world? Who are you? You would stand in awe and reverence, and the very idea of going to help anybody would be a blasphemy to you. You could not. He's going to come back to this idea of help. Uh, so, you see, it is the highest people who cannot work. Okay, so that's sort of end of a, a section. Um, now he's going to quote the Gita. Now you come back again, now you come back to the quotation we have just made. Though I don't see it, the quotation earlier, so it might be that not everything was noted down, or I'm not sure. The quotation we have just made, those whose whole soul is gone into the self, whose desires are confined in the self, who have ever become associated with the self, for them there is no work. Let's just quote the, quote the Gita and 
Uh, that's uh, 17, chapter 3, verse 17. Yastu, yastvatma ratireva syat, atma riptascha malavaha, atman yeva cha santushtaha, tasyakaryam na vidyate. Okay, there is no, there is no karyam, there is no work to be done for someone who is, uh, whose whole soul has gone to the atman. It's a beautiful uh, terms in the Sanskrit, atma rati. Uh, delighting in the self. Mm-hmm. Uh, atma tripta, f- completely satisfied, fully satisfied in the self alone. And atmani eva santushtaha. Well, that means almost the same thing. Atmani in the self, uh, completely content, santushtaha. For such a person, only karyam navidyata. There is no work, no duty, no nothing. Uh, but for the rest of us, so, but see how how poetic he, how poetically he puts it that uh, um, <laughs> if you see the lo- if you actually once see have one glimpse of God, get one glimpse of the Lord of the universe uh, doing everything, how could you work? You would consider it blasphemy to do anything because he is doing everything. Or Divine Mother is doing everything. How, I do something? Who am I? It's all Mother. So here you get this glimpse he gives us of, of the, uh, the realization of seeing God in everything. So the, now we come back to this Gita quotation. Those whose whole soul is gone into the self, whose desires are confined in the self, who have ever become associated with the self, for them there is no work. Now he gives a, a one of Sri Ramakrishna's stories. He often, you find Sri Ramakrishna's stories in his classes and talks again and again, but never, never, the source is never mentioned. He doesn't mention his master's name. A ship once passed over a mountain of magnet, and all the bolts and bars were drawn out, and it went to pieces. So this is the idea of, of when we, ha- we realize God, when we see God everywhere, then we can't work anymore. All the, all the bolts and nails are pulled out of the ship and the wood falls to pieces. Uh, you know, Sri Ramakrishna, that the, Sri Ramakrishna again and again, he, would, he quotes many times how Shambhu Malik asked him once, Sir, please bless me that I may spend all my uh, money in the service of people, in the service of God. And, and, he, and Sri Ramakrishna is like, what? Uh, the goal of life is not the building of dispensaries and digging of wells. If you should see God, will you say, oh, Lord, please build me some hospitals and dispensaries and, and build some wells for me? No. If you actually see God, you'll say, all you will say is, Lord, please give me pure love for your lotus feet. Please give me devotion. <laughs> That's all, when we see God, all those other desires vanish because we are completely fulfilled there. And then we see that it's God alone that's doing everything. So it is in ignorance, says Swamiji, it is in ignorance that all struggles remain because we are all really atheists. <laughs> because we haven't seen yet. As Sri Ramakrishna, he used, Swamiji also quotes the Sri Ramakrishna story, you know, you, you, you are all atheists. Well, how, how so? Imagine a thief uh, who is given a room to sleep in, and he knows that in the next room, there is a chest full of gold. And there's a thin wall between the two rooms. Will that man be able to sleep that night? Absolutely not. Similarly, there is this infinite mine of bliss within us. Can you sleep? If you can, then you're an atheist. <laughs> if, you weren't an, if you really were a theist, if you really believed that that's there and it's, it's, it, we can realize it, then you would be up all night struggling to realize it. So that idea. So here he's, he's, he's saying again, we are all really atheists. Real theists can never work. We are all atheists more or less. We do not see God. Believe in him. He is G-O-D to us and nothing more. There are moments, he's going on, there are moments when we think he is near, but then we fall down again. When you see him, who struggles for whom? 
Yes. It's beautiful when Swamiji starts getting on this. And he's speaking not from theory. He's speaking as a, an illumined uh, spiritual teacher, a world teacher who has, who has come for this purpose, to bring these teachings to us. He has this message for the world. When you see him, who struggles for whom? Help the Lord. Now he's going to come back to this idea of help. And I think at that time, and maybe still, I don't know, in Christian circles, do, they, do people talk about help the Lord? We have to help God because God needs our help. Come forward. Put more money in the basket because we need to help God in, in his world. <laughs> so Swamiji put, really pokes fun at this attitude. Help the Lord. There is a proverb in our language. Shall we teach the architect of the universe how to build? So those are the highest of humankind who do not work. The next time you use these silly phrases of the world and how we must all help God do this and do that for him, remember this. Do not think it. It is too selfish. Fascinating. If we think we're helping God, that's actually selfish thought. All the work you do is subjective for your own benefit. God has not fallen into a ditch for you and me to help him out by building a hospital or something of that sort. He allows you to work. He allows you to exercise in this great gymnasium, not to help him, but to help yourself. Okay, this is uh, very interesting. Uh, here he likens this world to a great gymnasium. Uh, sometimes in other places, a moral gym, we, have, we strengthen our moral muscles in this world. Mm. It's interesting, part of why it's interesting is because usually I, I love to quote uh, that incident uh, which came much later when Swamiji was in a different mood uh, in 1900 in Camp Taylor. He had finished his, he had really, he had basically delivered his message. He had finished his work. He had established the work in India. He came back to the West, partly to recoup his health. And then he was just, uh, just um, delighting in the self, I guess. And anyhow, he's camping with his close disciples, I think all women, uh, in Camp Taylor, which is north of San Francisco. And you can still go to the place, a uh, small campsite. There was a cast iron stove there and they would the, they would cook there and and they would meditate with Swamiji and um, at one point they were in Miss Bell's tent and Miss for I guess after breakfast or they were having a little class or something and Miss Bell says um, this world is a school we, an old schoolhouse where we come to learn our lessons and Swamiji fires at her who told you that <laughs> and Miss Bell well, I can't remember Swamiji didn't like it. He said, well, I don't think so. I think this, is a, this world is a circus, and we are the clowns tumbling. <laughs> so here he doesn't say it's a gymnasium. Here he's there when he was in Camp Taylor, he simply likens it to a circus, and we are the clowns tumble. And someone asked him, so why do we tumble, Swamiji? And he says, because we like to. When we've had enough, we will stop. So this is... Uh, we have different ways of conceiving our, uh, how, what is the meaning of this world? Why this world? This, this question arises, why at all should there be a world? If there is a divine reality and it's absolutely perfect and infinite and complete and our, nat our true nature is that, then why this? It's a really, it is a good question. Why this? Why all this mess? Why this karma? Why this coming and going? Why all this suffering? What's the explanation? And so we have a number of different answers. And one answer, favored by the staunch and the is actually it doesn't actually this doesn't act. It's not real. It's just a mirage of some kind. It's just uh, it's been superimposed on Brahman, and actually it's not real. Um, and it has a certain logical coherence, and it has a certain satisfaction. But uh, Sri Ramakrishna didn't emphasize that attitude, and neither did Swami Vivekananda. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna liked the ideal of play, of Leela. It's simply a divine play, and we are all part of the play. We are none other than the divine, and we are playing the divine play. And if we, once we rise to that place, then it becomes 
uh, simply a fun, simply a joy, uh, uh, an ecstatic joy. And Swami Vivekananda, in that famous letter to Frankincense, where he says, what fun, what fun. <laughs> the play, all parts of the play, it's all he, it's all he, the Lord, the, the playmate, the Lord, the infinite playmate, the eternal playmate. Uh, but so here, in the context of karma yoga, he suggests that, yes, we can also look on this world as a gymnasium, where, gradu where our goal is to get out of it, but we don't get out of it until we have uh, uh, strengthened our uh, exercise. And we are only allowed to work, we are allowed to work by the Lord. <clears throat> Do you think even an ant will die for want of your help? Most arrant blasphemy. Do you think you can help the least thing in this universe? You cannot. You can only help yourself in this gymnasium of the Lord. He allows you to work, and it is in order to help yourself. This is the attitude of work. If you work in this way, you will never be attached. Well, this is pretty... Uh, Stunning, actually. I can imag imagine being told, you, you can't actually help anyone. I'm constantly trying to help people. Um, we all try to help people. People come, they, they, they ask us for some help, we, we try to help them. And sometimes we try to help people who don't want our help <laughs> and drive them crazy. Uh, but this idea that we can help someone, well, say uh, one of our brothers, um, uh, stubbed his toe badly uh, the, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago and tore off the, the toenail. Uh, and so uh, tonight, I'll, uh, every other day, we dress the wound a little bit. It's doing fine. It's, it's not infected. But just every other day, we remove the bandage remove, and put a little saline solution on it, a little antibiotic ointment, cover it back up with a new fresh bandage. It's, it's doing fine. It's luckily no infection. So am I helping? I thought maybe I'm helping him. Hmm. Or am I just allowed to do this by the Lord? The Lord is giving me this opportunity to serve him, to play with him. That would be the more the attitude of the karma yoga. The Lord is allowing, is giving me this opportunity to serve him. Mother is giving this, this opportunity to serve her. Mother is giving me this opportunity to peep into her eyes as I dress a wound on a brother's toe. And why? He allows you to work, and it is in order to help yourself. Because what really are we called to do? We are called to uh, overcome our selfishness overcome our sense of ego, our, we think we're so important. And yet that's the big, that's the big stumbling block. So when we're uh, allowed to work, when we're allowed to serve, and we take that attitude, then gradually this idea that, oh, I'm helping my brother, I'm helping him by, I'm doing such a good job helping him, and he's, you know, he's going to get better and all that because of me. <laughs> that's uh, the viewpoint of ignorance, says Swamiji. The, the, the wise approach is to say, Lord is giving me this opportunity to serve my brother, uh, and let me do it unselfishly. Let me uh, rejoice. Let me not say, oh, darn. And I wanted to go uh, uh, play another round of solitaire. Uh, uh, I didn't want to bother with my brother's toe, but okay, I guess I got to go, brother. Teach me, you know. Rather, rejoice. I have an opportunity to serve the Lord. This is the attitude of work. If you work in this way, you will never be attached. If you always remember that it is a privilege which has been given to you, so that's interesting. Can we apply that to all the work? Because we are all called on to do different work, and some of it we take up as, uh, as our own choice. Uh, uh, if we're an artist and we're working on a painting, well, it's our choice, in a sense, to work on that painting. Uh, maybe it's been commissioned, then it's... But still, we're, we have a lot of freedom there. But can we consider that also as a privilege which has been given to us? for our exercise. The world does not need you at all. This world goes on. Millions of men and women in this world think they are the great people of the world. 
but they die. And in five minutes, the world has forgotten them. This is a very sobering thought. Think about it. Think about the, peop- the, uh, the loved ones we, we have, who have people known to us who have died. We're all old enough now that we have known people who have died, probably. Um, close ones, if not close ones, at least someone we've known who, have, who has died. How, how many people does the world remember? The, the, the well-known uh, figures, I mean, great, you know, great or horrible <laughs> leaders of countries. Okay, they're remembered for a few centuries, probably. At least their names are remembered. The, the uh, great spiritual teachers, their names are remembered. People like you and me? How many monks even in this, in this order? You know, they're, they're, we have a, a bulletin that comes out every month from our headquarters, and it's distributed to all the monks. It used to be sent by mail to the uh, head of the center, and then it would be read out or else passed around to all, so all the monks could read it. Now it's all done by email. So each monk, once a month, usually on the first or the second of the month, gets an email with a bulletin, the news. And every monk's name will come in that bulletin at least twice. First, when they become monks, that bulletin is sent out and said the following were uh, ordained into uh, sannyasa, and these are their names. And the second time every monk's name will come in that bulletin is when they leave the body. Uh, or if they leave the order, that, that's always sad. Sometimes some, some of the monks leave the order, and then it'll say so-and-so left the order. But otherwise, uh, that comes uh, when they leave the body. And there'll be about three or four lines where they, where they joined, when and where they joined, who was their guru, um, where they served, and what their disease was. Uh, usually it'll mention some like what was the cause of death. And then it'll have like three words. The Swami was known for his austere and uh, austere life and uh, scholarship. Or the Swami was loved by all for his uh, warm heart, or just one little phrase like that, and that's it. And within a few months, who remembers them? The center where they were serving? Things go on. Things, the, the things go on. They were essential parts of that center, but now things go on for all of us. Things go on without us, and they're going to go on without us, and we are going to leave. So that's something to remember. Hmm? People, we think we're so important. Millions of men and women in this world think they are the great people of the world, but they die. And in five minutes, the world has forgotten them. While they live, they think they are great ones. And when they die, they are like a drop in the ocean. Nobody thinks of them. God is living infinitely. Now, this is the, now comes the last portion where he gets uh, inspired and the fire comes out. <laughs> God is living infinitely. And then he's quoting the uh, Upanishads. Who dares live a moment, breathe a moment, if this all-powerful one does not will it? Taitiri Upanishad. The ever-active providence. All force is his. Within his command, a leaf does not move. The wind does not blow without him. As Ramakrishna would say, a leaf does not move, does not flutter on the tree without the will of Rama. Through his command, the winds blow. Through his command, the sun shines. Through his command, the earth lives. Through his command, death stalks upon the earth. He is the all in all, it's the Kata Upanishad. Blessed are we that we are given the privilege, allowed the great privilege of working for him, not helping him, working for him. Cut out this word help from your mind. You cannot help, it is blaspheming. You are here yourself at his pleasure. Do you mean to say you help him? You worship. When you give a bit of food to the dog, you worship the dog as God. God is in that dog. He is the dog. This should be your duty. 
He is all and in all. We are allowed to worship, stand in that reverent attitude to the whole universe, and then will come perfect non-attachment. The bonds of the heart will break, and the person will not be attached. This is the secret of karma. Bus. <laughs> End of the class. End of the uh, last class for advanced students. Uh, so moving how he gets, he gets this fire and he just starts quoting the Upanishads, uh, that everything, it's a privilege to be here and to uh, serve in whatever little way. If we have a chance to feed someone, say, consider it a privilege. I'm feeding God. It looks funny, God and the dog. We have to be careful not to get... Uh, I was wondering if uh, I was getting dyslexic for a moment. Mm, because... And for some, <laughs> for, I mean, and we were just talking about this this morning. Dogs also have a wonderful characteristic of loyalty to human beings. It is incredible. There is something divine about a, a dog's love for its master, isn't there? I mean, those who are dog lovers. <laughs> uh, what was the joke you said this morning? Those who say that diamonds are a girl's best friend didn't never had a dog. <laughs> Dog is man's and woman's best friend. But uh, here he's, he's uh, saying, cut out this word help from your... Let's read it once more. It's so beautiful, this last portion. Okay. While they live, they think they are great ones. And when they die, they are like a drop in the ocean. Nobody thinks of them. God is living infinitely. Who dares live a moment, breathe a moment, if this all-powerful one does not will it? The ever-active providence, all force is his. Within his command, a leaf does not move. The wind does not blow without him. Through his command, the winds blow. Through his command, the sun shines. Through his command, the earth lives. Through his command, death stalks upon the earth. He is the all in all. Blessed are we that we are given the privilege, allowed the great privilege of working for him, not helping him. Cut out this word help from your mind. You cannot help. It is blaspheming. You are here yourself at his pleasure. Do you mean to say you help him? You worship. When you give a bit of food to the dog, you worship the dog as God. God is in that dog. He is the dog. This should be your duty. He is all and in all. We are allowed to worship, stand in that reverent attitude to the whole universe, and then will come perfect non-attachment. The bonds of the heart will break, and the man, the woman, will not be attached. This is the secret of karma. So this is the secret that actually it's God calling us, allowing us, granting us the tremendous privilege to work for him, not to help him, to work for him, to work for her, to play with her, uh, to serve her, to worship her in everything we do. So we get this, as we talked right at the beginning, we touched on this work and worship, work as worship, work is worship, action becomes worship. So here he gives a taste of what that, what that feels like. Uh, when you give a bit of food to the dog, you worship the dog as God. God is in that dog. God is the, he is the dog. See how we, first we say <laughs> worship we, as God, then God is in the dog, and then God is the dog. <sighs> stand in that reverent attitude to the whole universe when we see God in everything. And that's a beautiful uh, um, lecture to read of Swamiji's, by the way, in Jnana Yoga, God in everything, uh, from the Isha Upanishad. When you, when you see God in everything, you stand in, reverent, in reverence to everything. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna's experience when he, his, uh, in the Kali temple, when his f f formal worship came to an end, he could no longer 
performed the worship in the Kali temple when uh, suddenly it was revealed that everything was consciousness. The image of the Divine Mother on the altar was consciousness, but the altar itself, made of marble, was also consciousness. And the copper vessels, the worship vessels, they were also consciousness. And the floor of the temple was consciousness, and the walls were consciousness, and the cat is consciousness, and the, and the wicked man walking outside is also the same manifestation of the same consciousness. And he, he, Swami said, in that mood, I began to shower flowers everywhere, because everywhere I looked it was only divinity, divinity. So uh, that's that standing in reverent attitude to the whole universe. So after that, Sri Ramakrishna uh, couldn't perform the worship in the temple, and others were found to conduct that, uh, that ritual. So any comments, questions? Yes, David. Um, oh, there's a microphone. Mainly so anyone listening online can hear the question as well. First of all, thank you for a most excellent class. Um, for Swamiji, is karma yoga implicitly a lower form of yoga, or does no. he not? Does he avoid those kinds of distinctions? Absolutely. He he uh, he. And it, it's one of his contributions, really, because traditionally karma yoga, you start with karma yoga for mental purification, and then you go on to. And so Swamiji really has forged somewhat of a new path here, and he says, yes, each yoga is a path to realization and takes us there. However, he also suggested that the ideal is a harmonious blending of all the attitudes. Because we have these different faculties. We have uh, what's called a, a connat connative or connative faculty, the faculty of willing. And for that, karma yoga. We have a, a, an effective uh, aspect, the emotions. For that, bhakti yoga. We have a, a, a knowing aspect, to, to the wanting to know. For that, jnana yoga. And actually, the, the willing also comes into both karma yoga and raja yoga, because raja yoga is also, in a sense, the focusing of the will uh, on meditation, in meditation. But we, also, we can also say that we, ha we all have a contemplative aspect to us as well. Almost, there are very few people who won't, when, if they get a quiet moment and see a beautiful, beautiful sunset, very few people who would, won't at least take a moment and look at that sunset and drink it in. So those, those, uh, those, uh, those four aspects, uh, uh, that's why four yoga is so beautiful, because it addresses all, the, uh, all our faculties. So our, our emotions are, are, are directed towards God through bhakti. Our uh, uh, intellect is engaged in uh, jnana yoga. Uh, and our will is, in, and, uh, is engaged in karma yoga, our active. We all have to work. We all have to be active. So that's why karma yoga is essential. How do we spiritualize our work as well? And our, uh, our, our contemplative faculty is to be uh, strengthened, and the will is to be also directed towards contemplation. So that way, it's a harmonious development. And uh, with the help of all these yogas, we go towards the goal. And of course, for different people, have stronger inclinations towards one or the other. But it's very rare to find someone who is exclusively and only in one, uh, one path. So that's Swamiji's ideal, really, is to combine all four. Vani, you have a question? Yes, thank you, Swamiji. Or comment. Uh, my question is about um, being able to recognize when you are doing work and worship, and how you transition to work as worship. Is, is there a way that you can appreciate or understand it as a householder? And does the work, when you see work as worship, does worship in its formal ritualistic form fall away? 
I think the worship in its formal ritualistic form falls away when work become work is worship at that highest stage, then there's no difference between, like Brother Lawrence, who has said that there's no difference for me b between flipping an omelet in the kitchen and being on my knees in front of the Blessed Sacrament in the chapel. Uh, for him, there was no difference at all. Everything was service of the Lord. Brother Lawrence is a perfect example of a, perf of a karma yogi who is uh, w w with tremendous devotion. Um, we actually, we've been reading this wonderful book and our monks reading at night. It's the conversations with Swami Sarvagatananda, sort of gems from his teachings. It's called, um, what is it called? Darn. Uh, Swami Sarvagatananda, uh, being, being spiritual and practical. Some, huh? Yeah, being spiritual, staying practical. Thank you. And he is constantly uh, saying, uh, when whatever work comes before you, do it for God. And of course, he's talking specifically to devotees of Sri Ramakrishna. He says, whatever you do, do it for Thakur. Thakur meaning name of Sri Ramakrishna is one of Sri Ramakrishna's appellations. Uh, do it for Thakur. <clears throat> whatever it is, if you have a job and you have to do something at your job, do that for Thakur. Say, this is also my service to you. I am being, so in the context of our class today, uh, feel that we try to feel that this also is an opportunity granted to me by the infinitely merciful Lord uh, to work for him, to do this for him, to worship him with this, with this work. So that's one, one part of it. I also love, Swami Veda Rupananda gave a very nice talk on karma yoga uh, probably many years ago. And he discusses the offertory prayer. And he suggested, uh, he gave a wonderful example. I think it was washing a car. He said, say you're going to wash the car. Before you wash the car, you say a little prayer. Oh, Lord, I have to wash the car. May I do this for you? And then you wash the car, and afterwards, again, you offer it. Oh, Lord, please accept this offer, washing of the car as an offering to you. I love that, this, uh, this practice of an offertory prayer. A very simple practice um, and very practical. We can do something like that. You know, I have to, I have to make this report. If we, if we can do that, Lord, or Divine Mother, or whoever is our chosen way of conceiving of the Divine, may I do this for your glory. May I just make this an offering unto you. May I understand that it is a privilege granted me by you that I can, do, that I can uh, uh, participate in this, your work or your play, or, or tumble with you in this way, whatever attitude we want to take. One more. Ah. Um, thank you. I, I loved your talk about the Leela. Mm. It all makes, it makes the whole thing make sense to me. Uh, uh. Um, I, uh, you just mentioned that this is the, the last class in a series. Right. And uh, so have you just recently covered the other main yogas and that won't come around for a while or how, how does that work? Oh, well, uh, see, w this Thursday class is uh, the, the different um, monastics uh, are assigned this class by rotation. Uh -huh. And about two years ago, probably uh, someone asked, let's do karma yoga. So I said, okay, I'll do karma. Currently, uh, Swami Sumanasananda has been doing bhakti yoga. Um, and Swami Medananda has just taken up raja yoga. Oh. So that, that those, are con those are going on. And jnana yoga probably was done at some point in the past, but maybe it's time to take it up again. Um, but so uh, usually this class happens once a month, but the last three months somehow due to various reasons, once I was sick, once I was traveling, once there was an important event that I had to attend. Uh, so I missed the last three. Uh, but um, yeah, so the, okay. this, this was the karma yoga, Swami Vivekananda's karma yoga, these eight classes, four for beginners, four for advanced. I'm not sure yet what the next class I'll take up is, but I might keep one more karma yoga class because there's one more talk Swami Vivekananda gave falling right in line with karma yoga called uh, The Secret of Work or work and its secret, which was delivered in California in 1900 in San Francisco, I think. And that is also 
uh, worth taking up because it gives a, a slightly different emphasis. Where there he, he emphasizes the means uh, that it's not the goal that we pay attention to, but the means, and that the the, the, the end is contained within the means. Anyhow, thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for me. It's been a beautiful talk by Perry uh, and Viveka Nandajan. Um, one question uh, in regards to uh, uh, Swamiji's attitude toward Karma Yoga. It seems like a lot of his talks on Karma Yoga were given here in America. So does that mean that he felt that maybe Karma Yoga was something that would more needed in adjustment of attitude than anywhere else, or certainly in India, or was that, uh, am I? Well, his, I, th I don't think, so. I don't, th I think he, f uh, th he, all the yogas were necessary. He taught all the four yogas here in, uh, Amer in the West. Uh, karma yoga, certainly, but actually karma yoga was only these eight classes. And, uh, uh, jnana yoga ended up being more classes, actually, because it got, got into the philosophy and the background philosophy and all that, and Raja yoga, also more classes. I'm not sure about bhakti yoga, how many classes, but bhakti yoga also had, had two phases, beginners and advanced. And so he came to spiritual life with this message of uh, spiritual life, of, of uh, really his master's message that uh, the divine is real, our true nature is divine, and the goal is to, of life is to realize that, and yoga is the path. Yoga is not really confined to Hinduism. You can see karma yoga and bhakti yoga, all these yogas you can see practiced in all the religious traditions. Uh, Christianity seems to focus mostly on uh, bhakti yoga, but actually look at Brother Lawrence, perfect karma yogi, uh, bhakti, bhakti yogi and karma yogi, and uh, someone like Meister Eckhart, very philosophical, he's like a jnana yogi. So we don't, we say that it's not, it, they're almost like not within Hinduism only, though they're presented in the context of Vedanta, but they're broad enough to help all seekers of truth in whatever tradition. And that really was his message, to bring, to bring the message, the glorious message of the divinity of the soul and the harmony of religions and uh, put in a lever for the good of humanity, as he put it once. He, because he had that role, that was his place in the life pattern. He came not dragged like we are by our karma and by our, our samskaras, our tendencies. He came as a divine, at, at the divine call to bring this message. So, and any, any other questions, comments? Any, any questions online? <laughs> 